stream metadata. Okay, here we go. Um, how did you, yeah, I'm working through OBS. How did you set this up as a stream? Did you do it through, oh, hello, and stream. Good morning or afternoon or evening or wherever you are. And thank you guys for joining me and our guest who you're going to hear from in just a second. And I'm going to mute that. There we go. So, uh, hey, I, my chat is working and I can read it, which is really awesome. So if you guys want to do a little roll call, tell me where you're from. I think that would be awesome. Uh, I can see a bunch of you out there. We are going to have a lot of fun here this morning. I want to just give you a recap from my last live, which was, you know, there's some things you can do to stay focused and grounded during these, let's say, crazy, chaotic times. Remember to get out and take walks every day, at least here in California, even though we are under this, you know, got to stay home rule. You are allowed to go out and walk. You're allowed to take your dog with you even, which, thank goodness, I wouldn't know how to walk without my dog. And get your head straight. There's no law against keeping your attention out, getting off of the bad news devices, take a breather from that, and just go out and see the world, which is what we do as photographers anyway. Look for inspiration. This morning we will give you a shot of inspiration. Use your notebook. Dan and I are big believers in journaling. I mean, he's going to show us his here. I've got millions of notebooks. This is my brand new one. Use your notebook, journal, put your thoughts in there, put the things you're challenged by, put drawings in there, do things with your notebook. It's a really handy device. Okay, so I want to give a big, huge welcome to Dan Milner, He's a documentary photographer. He's making funny gestures. We can't see him yet, but he's I can see it. He's not making obscene gestures. I just want to clear that up. Just funny ones. He's a documentary photographer. He's a photojournalist, a fantastic filmmaker, and I really mean that. We saw his film yesterday. It blew me away. And he's also an evangelist for Blurb, which is awesome because that's how we can make books and get our work out to the world. 
And let's talk, Dan, let's talk about what we are going to do today. We're going to talk about the three big things of photography. There he is, yeah. guys. Give him a big welcome. Thumbs yes. up. Yahoo. Whoa. Sorry hey, we, about that. My little, uh, my thing holding up my camera just went down. Let me. Uh, so somebody already said, what? He's not in black and white. Yeah, folks. He actually comes in color, living color. It's amazing. So I can almost, I can almost guarantee this is going to fall again. But if it does, it doesn't matter. I'll put it back up. It's and all it was part actually, of the show. It was starting to get slower and lower. But anyway, yeah, we're going to talk about a whole bunch of things. Primarily um, three different things that I think are, are what I would call a conversation that happens in the actual photo industry about photography and less about what happens in the online world, which is, you know, a little bit more gear heavy, tech centric. But a when photographers, bit, yeah. high level photographers get together, oftentimes they talk about three things. But before we get to those three things, there's a couple of things I wanted to show you, <clears throat> projects that I'm currently working on. And then also my journal, too, because I did sort of a cool experiment with a journal that I haven't started to use yet that nice. I think would be interesting. Earlier today, I was texting with a guy named Rick Elder, who's the director of a clothing company called Beyond. And about a year and a half ago, I started a collaborative project with he and Beyond. So technically, it's blurred and beyond in the background. And Rick and I as co-editors uh, in the in the foreground. And we did this thing called AG23. And this is what it comes in. It comes in a little slip case. You can see that. A little zippered slip case. And it's a little zine project that we did. That's a collaborative project with a goal of promoting understanding through dialogue and art. That's the only... The only uh, goal, the mission, was to just get people like yourselves to think about things that you may or may not have thought of before, or projects, or ideas, et cetera. Hang on one second. I know this thing's about to crater again. Okay, it's just there we part go. of the excitement of the It is. It's the whole thing. It's My house is not shifting down. It's just my iPhone. So there's nine contributors in the front of this. There's a QR code on the cover that takes you to the website, ag23mag.com. It's worth looking at. I'm going to make a film specific to this very soon because it's very important to me. I worked on it for a year and a half, and we are working on issue two now, believe it or not, even in the midst of all this craziness that's happening. Uh, Mark mentioned something earlier, journaling. I've kept a journal every day since 1993, so way back probably when some of you were like embryos. Uh, this is a huge part of my life. I love it. And no, this is a moleskin. Uh, Can we thing. see and some I, of it? Yeah, that's what this one is. Mine is a moleskin I'll, as well. I'll, I'll oh, basically, yeah. you know, I, I do artwork. I do photography, lots of writing. Um, and I'll use anything. It doesn't matter. But you can also make them through blurb. And so I did this nifty one that's about shifter. And I did it as a test. And so I did like graph paper. Ooh. I did photographs. I did, I used the shape tool. I did all kinds of stuff and it's smaller, it's six by nine, so it spits in my bag a little bit easier than the larger one, but that that's what I'm cool. working on. So you wanna talk about the three things that photographers really talk about? The real things, not the imaginary things that we often see and hear on the internet, but what are those like, things? So yeah. I, was, I started shooting professionally in 1988, basically. And, and since 1988 to the present day, I've never had a conversation with a professional photographer about bokeh. Never. Not, not <laughs> once. Bokeh I hear a, you. <laughs> bokeh is a YouTube term that doesn't exist in the actual industry. In the, in the actual photography world, bokeh is referred to as fall off. That's historically what people refer to, right. depending on, like, does a Hasselblad have a different fall off than a Leica? Yes. And so you had to understand what aperture would give you a specific fall off? Hang on a second, let me... Uh... I'm feeling better already, Dan. I thought I was just like... Really taught, use the term bokeh, but apparently you're another one. So, so Boca's immediately Boca's YouTube better. creation. No one in photography talks about that, and, um, and they talk about other things. They also don't get into arguments about what fifty millimeter lens is better. They don't. They ne <laughs> yeah. they never have, and they never will. It doesn't yeah. matter. So, to me, photography, whether you're a still life person or a landscape person, or like me, you shoot mostly people people based long term projects. 
is there are three items that go into a photograph that I think are absolutely essential. Without them, there is no point in walking around with a camera. You're sort of hunting for these three things first. The first two are, are unique in their own ways. The third one is where it gets a little tricky. The first one that we're going to talk about is light. Light is, the, in my opinion, is the single most important thing that you have to understand before you make great photographs. And light can be front lit, back lit, side lit. If you're looking for a couple of photographers to study light wise, look at Sebastio Salgado. I think mm. Salgado sort of opened my mind in terms of shooting into the light. Yes. I was taught in photography to school to shoot with the sun over my shoulder. And, you know, you always had to have the sun front lighting your subjects. And that's not the case. Shooting into the light. Um, will open up the other half of the world to you. Um, there's another guy who did, who's known as a reportage photographer, but he also did portraits, Antonin Kratokville. I've mentioned him before. Uh, his portrait series in particular, those things, he's famous for sort of shooting into the light. That's a good thing to look at. Backlit, sidelit. I want to show you a, um, an image that I think is, I'm going to turn this down, an yeah. image that really uh, is based on light. This is a, by the way, this is an 11 by 14 double weight fiber silver print made in the dark room by yours truly. So I had to, this was blood, sweat and tears. Hang on. I'm that's gonna move the, it that's the real deal, Dan. I mean, you, yeah, that's a real, uh, the real deal that, going into the dark room, 11 by 14. Bam. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a picture that's based on two things. It's based on form and it's based on light. So right. obviously you've got this guy in the foreground. And he's my primary subject. I have my middle ground secondary subject here. But the real the real reason this works is because of this light source coming from the back. So what that, is that light source, by the way? Where is that all that coming? That is a giant, um, basically a giant, a massive collection of like sparklers that are gone off. It's in a little, uh, it's in a little Albanian town in the mountains in Sicily called Mezzayuso. And um, they're bringing the, the virgin out of the church. It's a religious procession in Sicily. And also following it up, this I made seconds later, Amazing. which is now you're, you're seeing a little bit of better indicator of what the light source is. All the smoke but, and stuff, right? But again, this is about form and it's about light. And this is in the middle of the night. So 3,200 speed film, wide open, very, very few and far between images. You know, you're making a lot of mistakes while you're making one of these. You're shooting 10, 15, 20 images that don't work. But just, just, reason, just slow up there for a second. Yeah, guys, he said thirty-two hundred film speed. Now, that is such a different thing than cranking our ISO up to thirty-two hundred. That yeah. means you had to take what triax? No, it's T-Max thirty, T-Max thirty-two hundred. Oh, it's thirty-two hundred. Okay, good. Yeah. So you didn't now have you to can you can take triax and push it to thirty-two, but it really yeah. starts to break down about sixteen hundred. Pretty, pretty yeah. messy. Yeah. Yeah. So okay, but he was using film at 3200, which is unbelievably off the chart, basically. Yeah. So know? and film doesn't see in the dark like digital does. So I could have shot that same image with digital at 400 ISO, but right. And it sees in the dark. It sees in the dark kind of too well at times. And you, if I had shot that with digital, I would have had to have gone in post production and brought the image back down to what I saw in real life. Right. But film. Film was more limiting in a good way, I think. Um, and you had to commit. So 3,200 was a film that you could shoot at 800 and all the way up to 64,000. And you had to understand how to use it, what developers to use, what agitation, what temperature. You know, it was an art form of understanding films yeah. and papers and chemistry. Um, that's we, we don't have that today. I mean, obviously, you can get into softwares and filters and all that. But it's a very different thing. One's not better than the other. They're just different. And I shot nothing but 3,200 T-Max for 10 years. So I knew that film really well. Wow. Um, Another image that's based on light is right here, also from Sicily. And you can see I'm shooting back. Ay, sorry about that. This is. Um, it has an interesting days. element, you know? Not wanting to stick here at all suddenly. Hopefully that will address it. Jesus. So I'm shooting backlit into the sun, and it's giving me these long shadows. The, the sun broke out of. Uh, a major snowstorm just for a couple of minutes. These kids were wearing these angel wings on their backs and the sun came through that. Had I shot this front lit, I would have never printed it. It would not that have been. That is really finished. cool. Yeah. So the entire time that I'm working, all I'm doing is I'm studying the light. I'm studying where it's coming from and I'm anticipating the pieces on the chessboard in front of me, but everything starts with light. That is the number one thing. 
I see a lot of photographers walking around at noon, you know, shooting. And I, at noon, I'm either in open shade. If I'm lucky, I get a cloudy day or I'm taking notes and I'm doing research about what I'm going to do that afternoon when the light gets better. I don't waste a lot yeah. of time in bad light because if you're trying to make the best possible images you can, you realize very quickly that those are very rare and a certain set of ingredients has to exist and you're not going to get that at noon typically. Now, I know what you're thinking. Um, maybe you don't have any other option and you have to shoot at noon. There's a couple of photographers that I know, um, I know them a little bit personally, but just historically, there's a guy named Alex Webb, who's a Magnum photographer. Right. And Alex is one of the only people I've seen who can shoot consistently amazing work in some of the worst lighting conditions you've ever seen. He's a documentary guy, shoots for the geographic. He's a yeah. Magnum photographer, very intelligent dude. His stuff from Haiti, uh, Hot Light, Half Made Worlds is his book from Haiti. Uh, unbelievable book. That was a seminary, seminal book in my life of seeing that work for the first time and saying, oh my God, I've never seen anything like this. All right, shall we move on to point number? Please. Dose? Okay, so light. Everybody's light. got that, right? Number Boom. one is light. Number two is timing. Cartier-Bresson called this the decisive moment where you are basically waiting for the ingredients to happen. I see these people online shooting 200, 300, 400 images of something. And I'm thinking to myself, why on earth would you ever do that? The greatest, especially when you're talking about documentary work, the greatest work ever done is always happens in one or two frame moments. That's right. And it's, and it's gone. That's why there's so many historical images made with the Leica, which is one of the slowest cameras out there, is the Leica is a, capturing that one moment, that one frame. If you're shooting 40 frames of something, chances are it's probably not that great. I mean, look at that thing. It looks like, uh, you know, you could pound nails with that thing. Bring, bring, bring this up, Jared. This is this is the Leica M2, the same camera that Cartier-Bresson used. So, of course, I got, you know, I had to get this camera because what he shot with. But this is a solid camera. This is many years old. I, I've carried this all over the place. And yeah. it's rugged, simple, You, it's compact. It's not obtrusive also for street photography. You know, if you have your hand over this thing, you're, you're not like put, putting this massive camera in somebody's face. But yes, capturing the moment. Yeah, I mean, timing is, is critical and you have to basically anticipate what's happening before it happens. And if That's also it. the other thing too, is if you're using a camera with a mirror that blacks out the viewfinder, yeah. just think about this. If you saw the image, if you saw the moment, you actually missed it because to get it, you should have seen black. You should have, the mirror should have blacked out during That's the time right. that you're making that, that movement. That's one of the things I love about rangefinder cameras is there's no mirror black up. So you're That's always right. seeing in real time, you don't, nothing is obstructing your view, which I, which I like a lot. Um, moving on to the second point, this timing thing, I want to show you a couple of images. I'll go back to another image from Sicily, which is seemingly a pretty simple photograph. It's um, it's a guy nailed up to the cross here. There's three or four people down below. This is in the middle again of another another procession or what they, processione. But also I want you to notice right here on the side of the frame, that is a butterfly that is captured mid-flight in the middle of this. So that's called number one, luck. But two, everyone that looks at that image looks and says, is that a butterfly? Is that a real butterfly? And I'm like, yes, it is. It's a giant butterfly, but it's caught mid-flight in the middle of that. Now, the guy on the left-hand side here is also making a gesture with his hand. Right. And that's critical. That gesture and that butterfly play off of one another on opposing sides of the frame. Um, I knew that he was going to make gestures because he's been doing that over and over again. I did not know that the butterfly was going to be there, but I was ready when it happened. And so that is what good timing is or lucky timing. Um, this is the very first image I ever had on the AP wire, which is the Associated Press for those who don't know. Uh, yeah. Historically, one of the most important news gathering organizations in the world. I did my first work for them in 1992. This is at the political convention in Houston. And as you can see, this is not a pretty picture. This yeah. is a picture about timing. This is These are the Houston Police Department basically cracking heads on a bunch of protesters who were protesting from a group act up i think was the group that they were with and uh there's my buddy john in the background 
which I gave him a, a relentless, uh, you know, hazing because he didn't get this picture. I did. <laughs> uh, but this is this is all about a moment. This is about time. You know, five minutes later, this was gone. Um, five minutes later, we were all having our heads cracked by the Houston PD, believe it or not. They were they were trying to crack skulls that night. But this is a, a really good moment, a good timing moment. And that's what it's kind of what we're after. OK, let's yeah. move on to the last point. Be before you do that, let me yeah. just uh, introduce Dan to any of you guys who've joined us. Uh, we're here with Dan Milner, documentary photographer, photojournalist, filmmaker, blurb evangelist, and just a basically a really cool guy. Okay, Dan, number three. Thanks, Mark. That was so, so hey. kind. Well, you know. I'm okay, here. so we had number one was light. Number two is timing. Number three and is... All of my friends are so sick of hearing me talk about this, but it's true. It, this is what really matters. We're not sick of you talking about it, though. Just light, gonna... timing, and this is the real... This is the piece de resistance. This is the really tricky part. And this is what I can tell you, but I can't help you with. The third part is composition. And composition is as unique to you as your fingerprint. And finding what your composition is can take, it took me 14 years to figure it out. Now, if you want to blow your mind and you want to look at atypical composition, look at a photographer named Gilles Perez, another Magnum photographer, and that's G-I-L-L-E-S-P-E-R-R-E-S -E -E or P-E-R-E-S-S, -E -E one of those two. Gilles did a book called Telex Iran which was about the Iranian revolution in 1979. I found this book in college and I opened it and I literally had to close it and sit by myself for a couple of minutes because I had never considered compositions as complex as what Gilles was doing on a daily basis. And by the way, if you can find Telex Iran, that book is a collector's item. It's worth a fortune and it's a fantastic book. And thanks to Paul Giroux, I have a copy of it. Thank you, Paul. So, Composition-wise, this is another image from Sicily. It's in a town called Ribera, which is known for the jumpers. And during Sicily, the men of the town gather in the square and they join hands and they run in these lines through the streets, jumping in unison over and over and over again. So I knew they were coming and I jumped out in the middle. This guy's in my foreground right here. Yeah. And I have a foreground here, I've got a midground here, and I've got these guys in the background with the smoke and the buildings in the background. Um, this is what I realized was sort of my composition, the composition that I was always trying to attain. Now, I got run over by these guys very shortly thereafter. They didn't do it on purpose. It's just part of the process of being there. And I ended up sort of on the ground trying to hold on to both of my cameras. So I only got a couple of frames. They weren't trying to steal the cameras. They were just, I was crushed in the crowd. The closest I've ever come to losing both of my cameras was about 10 seconds after this image was made. But I knew I had this image. I focused on the background, let the foreground go soft. And what I'm doing is I'm using a wide angle lens to build depth in a two dimensional image. Right. And your composition, you're not going to find it online. You're not going to find it um, studying what other people have done. You're going to find it by shooting every single day. And you're going to find it by making mistake after mistake after mistake and not feeling it. And then all of a sudden, you're going to feel it. And the key is to be able to reproduce that feeling on a consistent basis. And over time, you'll, you'll understand what your composition is. If you just go copy what other people have done, you will never be a great photographer because you're just copying work that's already been done. So you've got to go out and break some eggs in the process of trying to understand how this works. And that Gilles Perez has one composition, Alex Webb has another, Susan Mizellis has another, Paolo Pellegrin has another, Alex Maioli has another, Martin Parr has a totally different compositional style than all of these other people. You know, you look at, just take one agency like Magnum or Seven, another great agency, and you look at the range of photographer they have, they're so different. And that came from every single one of those people spending years refining their technique and their understanding of what they're doing. So light, timing, and composition are the, th the primary ingredients in my mind of what makes a great photograph. Dan, that's brilliant. By the way, you guys, we are going to be releasing a course with Dan, a course. Okay, I mean, you're getting the Baskin Robbins little ice cream scoop thing here, which is making us all hungry for more, right? But imagine a full course with Dan taking hours on each one of these points. Uh, it's gonna happen. 
we're just waiting for the timing. He's a busy guy. As soon as we can free him up enough, we're going to shoot that course. It's going to be amazing. Okay, so thank you, Dan. We're going to take some questions, and then Dan's got some pointers. Should we go through those first? For, Up to you. Uh, let's take a couple of questions, and we'll close on that. So yeah. uh, let's see. Of course, yeah, about time. Three points or a lifetime of work. That's not a question, but thank you. You're absolutely right. That comes from Chris. Thanks, Chris. Uh, and somebody else, Dan, they're signing up for the course already. We've got to get this done this <laughs> afternoon, okay? They're yeah, already, we're going to bang this thing out today on Sunday. They're already lining up. So uh, who has a question out there? Meanwhile, you guys put your questions, but meanwhile, Dan, give us those tips for surviving the craziness that we're going through right now. I think this is um, these are points that are about working from home, which in the in the middle of this thing, um, there's a lot of people working from home who've never really had to do that. Yeah. And what it what it and I've worked at home since 1990, 1997. So I've been working and on basically the same sort of structure for a long time. And what I realized is things for me, like if I had to get up and commute for an hour to work, I would kind of be bothered by that. Right. Because I've never had to do that. But for the other another person. That's so much a part of their routine, and it's this really welcoming sort of in entryway into their day, whether it's getting on the BART for an hour or Caltrain or whatever and heading into the city. That's a part of their ritual. And so a lot of these folks are stuck at home now, and I know people are talking about cabin fever and about you know just being crazed by being at home. So there's, there's a couple of things that I think are really important, and they all have to do with setting things. And the, the number one thing is set an alarm. It's very easy to sort of let yourself go in the mornings. And, but here, here's the caveat to that. If you're sleep deprived, and, and I mean that seriously, there's a lot of Americans who are sleep deprived, then sleeping in a little bit from home is not the worst thing in the world. But what I think is good is setting an alarm and getting into a routine in the morning. And there's good routines and bad routines. What I do is I make coffee. I get up typically five to six o'clock in the morning. I get up, I make coffee, and I read a paper book for at least an hour. And what that does is a paper book in particular, not online, not your phone. The phone is the worst thing you can look at in the morning. The paper book sets your brain to consume and understand and create long form content. Yeah. And, and a long form brain in a short attention span world is a huge advantage. So yes, set an indeed. alarm. Number two is set goals. I have both a digital and a print calendar every single day. And I have a tracking list of what I have on tap for that day. And it feels really good to check things off. You feel like you're accomplishing things and you are. There you go. So this is my, I have this yellow pad that I every day follow. And it's got to get checked off. If whatever doesn't get checked off goes to the next day. But but I actually make a game out of checking everything off every day. And there, there's Dan right there. Boom. Yep. I'm going to check that there. off. I should be on there in all caps. Yeah, well, you are. It's written in gold ink, actually. I expect no less. I mean, okay, point three boom. is um, set limits. So you set an alarm, you set goals, and you set limits. So one of the misconceptions about working from home is that you can loaf off and do whatever you want. The truth is your job, when you work at home, your job is always right there. Yes. You don't need to commute. It's literally staring you in the face. And if you don't set limits, you'll end up working 16, 18 hours a day. And you'll waste a ton of time, too, by, like, going online and, and you know, trying to do a bunch of stuff you don't need to do. So set parameters and say, look, I'm going to work from 8 to 6, or I'm going to work for three hours and take an hour break, whatever it is. Yes. Set limits. Number four, um, to, this is sort of to your point, Mark, which is set your heart rate. Um, you've got to exercise. Yeah. And you do not need a gym. You do not need a single piece of equipment. You can do a body weight routine in 15 or 20 minutes, and it will absolutely spike your spike up all the positive in you for the rest of the day. Whether it spikes your brain, it sparks, spikes your heart rate, your blood pressure, everything. You've got to exercise. I'm a big yoga fan. I've been doing yoga every day for years and years. Me too. I do it by myself. Again, yoga is not about flexibility. You don't have to be good. There's a million tutorials on YouTube that are very good. Just start small, learn to breathe, et cetera. So spike, set your heart rate. And five is set all the power options to off. That's my last tip. At some point in the day, you turn off your phone, your iPad, your laptop, your television, 
and you go out. And in my opinion, the best thing that you can do when you power off and you set everything to off is daydream. So daydreaming is an incredibly important part of being creative. We all got in trouble for it at school um, over and over again. Stop daydreaming. Your head's in the clouds. Well, guess what? That is where most good ideas come from. They come when nothing else is taxing your brain. So set, a, set an alarm, set a goal, set a limit, set your heart rate, and set everything to off. Boom. Dan, I now know why we synergize so well, because... Those are the exact points that I follow. And I think, you know, it's if you if you look into very creative people's lives, they're doing some form of these five things. There's no question yeah. about it. Yeah. And I, I like you have worked from home for years and you have to discipline yourself, as you said. You have to put yeah. those edges on the channel. Otherwise, you're just who wants to stare at a, a friggin' computer all day and not get anything done? That's the worst thing you could do. The computer, Bingo. Yeah, the internet has been both an, a magical thing and a very, a very harmful thing in some ways. And I think it's sort of pulled some of the humanity away from us because we think we can replace it by looking at a screen. And that's it's an impossibility. We can't do that. So, so getting true. away from it, you know, getting away from the news cycle in particular is a very healthy thing. We have a lot of questions, so we're gonna kind of do speed. You know, speed answers. I'm just saying yeah. that. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'd like you guys to tell amateur photographers that they don't need an expensive digital or analog camera to enjoy their own photography as an artistic expression. Can you please address this? Well, I, I you know, I said this on my last, I don't know, we, we need to have a, a wide angle here. These are different cameras I've used over the years of these and start shooting with it again you well, know like the you thing right? is, if, if you're a professional prof photographer and you're in the field working every day you're not think the only thing you're thinking about your gear is do i have what i need to make the pictures that i know i need to make right once you've answered that question you never think about the gear ever again the, I, I bought a Hasselblad in about 2000 and I paid $65 for the camera, the, the back, the body, the finder, and the lens total, because this was prior to the hipsters finding Hasselblad and film cameras, and no one wanted them. So I shot commercially all of my, my entire portrait, seven years of shooting professional portraits, I shot with a $65 camera. You don't need a fancy camera. All you need is a light tight box that'll expose a piece of film, or you, know, you can go buy a used um, you know, Fuji X-T1 or whatever it is, it doesn't matter. The, the camera is never a part of the conversation once you've decided what to use. Yeah, I've been, a trying, foam, I've been trying to use this one. I'm having a little trouble with it though, Dan. I don't know, uh, I can't get the lens cap off and it's it's a Just little spongy. It. It's a little spongy. There you go, but it'll work. I'll keep working on it. All right, so everybody, look, don't friggin' worry about the equipment. Get something that works and use it. Um, I'm curious about how you deal with environmental dangers while, while carrying camera gear. I shoot in Oakland and Berkeley, and often I'm the only person around with hundreds of dollars worth of physical items. Yeah, so, you know, it's a good question. There have been, um, there have been plenty of times in the past where I've been in scenarios and locations where it was not safe and was working in a very dangerous environment. But there's a couple of things. If you are new to photography, you really have no business being in those environments because if you're new, you don't have the skill set to really come out of an environment like that with, with the goods. And you're not only kind of wasting your own time, you're wasting the people you're photographing, you're wasting their time. So you have to practice your craft until you're good enough to be able to work in those environments and work quickly under very changing scenarios. But there's a second part of this, which is how you carry yourself. You have to be able to gauge the energy in a particular scene and how people are going to react to you being there. If you go into a, de a, a dangerous situation, you can read people immediately. You can find the people who are going to have a problem with you and the people who aren't. But it's how you speak about your work, why you, how you can defend why you're there and what you're doing. I've had problems, you know, I've been, there have been very dangerous times here in the States, other parts of the world where, you know, people aiming guns at me and asking for money and cameras and things. I've never had to give my cameras away because I've been able to explain what I was doing and why I was there and why I was not going to give them my camera. Now, if it came down to it, I would happily hand over my camera to, to keep my life. 
but it never got to that point because I didn't cower away. I just said, look, I'm not, I'm not a tourist. I'm here working this is my job and this is why I'm here. So, but my, my advice to most of you is to avoid those scenarios as much as humanly possible. You know, you just don't want to get into really dangerous environments. Yeah, it is a little freaky when you're walking through a dangerous area and you've got a multi-thousand dollar piece of equipment and uh, you, you don't want to make it too tempting, but I'm with no. you. Here's, yeah. here's an awesome question. What's the most good I can do for someone else with my camera right now? That is a great question. Thank you for that one. Yeah, that is. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example, something that happened this morning that absolutely blew my mind. Um, and it's a little bit indirect answer to your question, but I'll get to your question in a second. So I was talking to you earlier about, I was on, I was texting with Rick Elder, who's the director of Beyond, the senior fellow senior co-editor of the zine we did. And he said, someone from Italy texted him yesterday and said, I'm carrying a copy of AG23 with me during the middle of this crisis as a reminder of what art and culture is actually about, the power of art and culture. So it could be as simple as making a portrait of a friend. It could be as something as simple as making a photograph that you think is important or interesting and sharing it with a specific person. Doesn't necessarily mean putting it on Twitter, or Instagram, whatever, but it could be making a photograph making a small print and writing a letter to someone about what that image means to you and maybe you think it means something to them. It's about sharing some an actual personal connection, not a yeah. necessarily an online connection. You know, that's one of the things I mentioned in one of my videos. The thing about photography is it transcends all these barriers of gender, race, geography, culture. And what it does is it allows us to have that view of something that we wouldn't have had on our own. And that's the power of that kind of connection. Look at some of these amazing photographers like Dorothea Lange, who gave the world a, a view of, at that time, the depression years. And you know maybe you're sitting on the other side of the country, have no idea what it, how bad it was in some part of the country, but she got inside that person's life and connected you to that moment. Yeah. Oh, and through history, you know, the W. Gene Smiths of the world, the Salgados of the world that yeah. brought, you know, Gene, Gene Smith to me was the single single best documentary photographer in the history of the world. And, and Gene Smith brought us the country doctor. He brought us Pittsburgh, Minamata, the Spanish Civil War, all these projects that were, you know, back in the era of the picture magazines where there were no, there was no television. You weren't going to get scenes like this. Those picture magazines arrived once a month and just absolutely blew the minds of people all over the world. So, yeah, photography still still has that ability. Um, Margaret Burke White taking photographs of Gandhi, you know, who, who people had barely heard about, but all of a sudden they're seeing photographs of him. Yeah. Photography, guys, we can, we can change the world with photography. I mean, that's the bottom line. For sure. All right, one last question here. Um, how about this one? The influence of weather and color in photography. Uh, wait a minute, sorry, that just moved around. Um, there we go. And as a photographer, how to use it to your advantage. So weather and color, okay. You wanna talk about so, weather? Well, it's funny because um, I live in New Mexico. I've never been a landscape photographer in my life. I've shot a couple of landscapes over the years, but I've never really been good at it. It's not what sort of fires me up. However, I'm very, very much an outdoor person. I grew up hunting, fishing, hiking, uh, climbing, paddling, the whole deal, and I still do much of that today. And yesterday I went out and more springtime New Mexico, which typically means storms and wind. Those are yeah. two of the big things and pollen. And the sky here in New Mexico is the single best sky of any place of anywhere in the world I've ever been. And so yesterday I sat on the patio during different times of the day, looking at the same patch of sky and having an understanding and appreciation of, of what the time of day did to the color and mood of the sky. And I made photographs of this. And so you have this unbelievable dark, opal blue skies with storm clouds and thunder and lightning and what color does when it comes to weather is set mood you know if you look at steve mccurry's work from the monsoons in india and you look at that pouring rain where some of those images could be even though india is so colorful they could be shot in black and white because there's so little color because the rain has just pulled everything out so color is going to give you mood 
Um, light will give you direction, but the but weather typically corresponds to mood. A beautiful sunrise, orange and yellows and reds that make you feel up and great. Whereas yesterday, the images I made here are the most foreboding looking skies that you've seen, but it's this cold blue foreboding moment. Awesome. You guys, thank you for joining us. We're going to wrap up here. I see a lot more questions. Um, we'll take them up in future live broadcasts. Yeah. You know, we love having Dan part of our channel. I know you guys do too. So on that note, I want to make sure that you do a couple of things. One, we're going to keep doing these live broadcasts. The next one will be Tuesday at 10 a.m. I don't have the subject picked out yet, but I've Give me a day or two and I will have it. I want you guys to join us. Bring along someone else because we can do a geometric progression here. If every one of you brings somebody else to the next broadcast and to the next and the next, we can grow exponentially. And that's really important because don't you think this is the kind of information people need from YouTube? I mean, come on. There's plenty yeah. of videos out there about cameras and light, you know how you develop in Lightroom, but this is the real deal. You're not going to hear this anywhere else. Yeah, I'm sort of fortunate because I suck so bad at the tech side and I just don't have, <laughs> I don't have any passion for it. You know, Lightroom to me is a means to an end. Yeah. And I, I applaud all the developers who built it because I wouldn't have the first clue. But the truth is that it's just a means of getting, arriving at a photograph. And I think there is a real lack of, of legitimate uh, photo education and understanding on YouTube because great photography and building a following often don't correspond with one another. The people yeah. with the biggest followings often are not the best photographers. They're just people that are really skilled at building, building a following. Most of the best photographers are working full time. And, and frankly, 99.9% .9 of the best photographers in the world aren't on YouTube. They don't even have channels. They are working full time and you probably don't know who they are. So it's, it's a pretty fascinating um, understanding once you dive into, into both worlds. And the YouTube world is, is important and it's interesting and there's a lot of great things. But the other part of the photo industry is equally as, as interesting. True that. So bring along somebody else, share the video, make sure you do subscribe if you haven't already and ring that bell so you get notified. And come along to the next one. And you know, listen, we love hearing your questions. Uh, by the way, this video will be, as soon as we're done, it will be live again on YouTube so you can watch it again. You can send it to your friends. You always have it there. I'm so, going to try to figure out how to keep my phone from falling. It's suction, <laughs> it's suction cup to my file cabinet. It should work, but it fell like three times, so I apologize for that. But I think you were doing it on purpose just to prove that Technical stuff does not need to be perfect to get your message across. Isn't that and true? My and my sister called in the middle, and I'm getting a <laughs> relentless barrage what is that? of text messages from someone. Oh, whoa. Okay. Somebody just knew you were on the air, and that's what you're doing. I didn't know I didn't know if you were wiping bugs off the screen. No, or? it's I'm getting text messages <laughs> okay. like one every two seconds. I, 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 don't get me started on text messaging. <laughs> He's somebody said those piggy suction cups suck. Okay. Yeah. I, it's gonna, I, it, I didn't it's know they're called work. piggy. We're, we're getting there, guys. Yeah. You know, you're getting the raw version of this whole thing, which is always more exciting. So, Dan, thank you. Thank you again for joining us. Guys, I am going to talk him into doing this course as soon as we possibly can because this is the real deal, right? Okay. Leave your comments on the actual video. Subscribe, like, share, and remember to get out and capture your own images of life.